Welcome back to Raw Politics. Now, the European Parliament held a debate today on an issue becoming more urgent by the day. How to fend off foreign interference in next year's European elections. Now, the spread of misinformation and troll farms were high on the agenda. But as MEPs debate, a newer threat described as fake news on steroids is coming. So-called deep fakes use artificial intelligence to create a bank of patterns in voice and facial expressions. And they can essentially be used to make anyone seem to be saying anything. Let's take a look. We're entering an era in which our enemies can make it look like anyone is saying anything at any point in time. This is a dangerous time. You know, when I said in 2004 that there were no red states or blue states in the United States of America, I was wrong. Well, that was clearly not uh, Barack Obama. And uh, now with me in the studio, and I can assure you it really is them, we have Jan Zaradil. He's a Czech uh, MEP, and uh, he's also the ECR's group, ECR Group's candidate to be the next uh, European Commission president. And Maritja Schake, Dutch MEP from the D66 party and the ALDE group. Right, when we see something like that, and I think that's just uh, a small example because we, there's a lot more on the Internet. How worried are you? I'll start with you, Maritja. Uh, how worried are you about this threat? I think the broad threat of interfering in elections and really stealing the right of people to vote for their representatives by secret ballot and universal suffrage is very serious. And there's threats from many sides. I mean, from foreign entities, uh, but also through the business models of social media that are really distorting the public debate, eroding trust, and eroding trust in liberal democracy. So we have to be ahead of the curve. And I think the deep fakes that you mentioned are that next curve. The examples that we saw, they're not brilliant yet, but the technology is moving fast. And mm. if somebody has enough resources, they can already produce a very, very hard to detect uh, alternative deep fake of someone and just imagine what it would mean if there would be a video out there of you know a president declaring war exactly. and even in 10 minutes that can lead to enormous confusion and even uh, a counter-attack so we have to be very vigilant when it comes to the very essence of our liberal democracy yeah, and when, when you saw that I mean what did that make you think elections I, are coming I saw that piece already and uh, uh, the truth is that this one is far from being perfect. I never believed that this was a real Obama. But, yeah, but it's you, getting better. The technology yeah, yeah, is getting absolutely. better. Absolutely. It will improve. And new technologies are here. We have to fight this, definitely. And this is uh, a shaky ground because uh, on one hand, we can develop some counter technologies. On the other hand, we should be very careful not to go too far in curbing the freedom of speech or freedom of expression. So, yeah, it'll be, it'll be dramatic. It'll be difficult. Mm -hmm. uh, for instance, I have serious doubts whether European political parties, for instance, that they will run in in uh, their in the elections as well. You mentioned me like a Spitzenkandidat of mm -hmm. the ECR, and I have doubts whether European political parties have been able to meet those challenges and to make some devices and to. Why do you say there's a risk to freedom of expression when we're talking about deepfakes? What is the risk there that you're talking about? Well, uh, we have various servers that are at least suspicious or that could be considered to be suspicious, uh, that could have some unclear background uh, and uh, that could be even investigated. Uh, but on the other hand, we can have uh, also servers or, uh, or news, some, some uh, newspapers that uh, can be perhaps only critical. I, I, guess, I suppose you're talking about misinformation rather yeah, than making yeah. someone so, say something so that they're not actually saying. Sometime, yeah, sometimes it's not that easy to make uh, a clear distinction between what is real misinformation and fake news and what is just a pure and uh, justifiable criticism. Well, just look at last week from the White House, we saw a video exactly. that was tampered of the journalist. with being, being presented as authentic, right? So this was a uh, so this is not, journalist this is uh, with, not a with the White House vision. intern. Yeah. That's right. So the White House actually presented as authentic a video in which it seemed like a CNN journalist had been, you know, very aggressive towards um, uh, someone working at the, at the White but House. But it was altered in some ways and therefore could be misinterpreted. I think that's, that's what exactly. you were... Exactly. Yeah. And so for right. people who think that this deep fake is the future, it's already among us today. Manipulated videos that are suggesting to tell a specific story with a political agenda have already been used at the highest level. And to, to, to give us uh, more insight on that and bring his expertise, uh, joining us uh, now live from Brussels is Fabrice Potier. He's a senior advisor at the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity and senior director at Rasmussen uh, Global. 
Uh, it's good to see you there, Fabrice. Now, you predicted a big wave of deep fakes coming our way. Is this the next frontier in uh, disinformation and how big of a threat is it? It is the next frontier and it is closer than we expect. But actually, interestingly, the videos you showed of Obama are not deep fake. They are more the traditional type of video fake, uh, meaning that it involves the video production uh, team. Deep fakes, by essence, will just involve a machine, an algorithm that will, for days or hours, basically roam the internet, use audio and video file to, to create from scratch a fake video. And this is where it gets very complicated to spot from the real authentic videos to the fake one. And I think what we ought to do is to already prevent that, that next wave. The reality is we've been always one foreign meddling election too late. We've always looked back. Now we need to look forward and try to prevent the next wave because the assumption is in a few years' time, this technology will be widely available. And it will not just be countries. It will also be non-state actors, individuals, who will be able to fake their way through an election, through a public debate, and to try to distort the truth. So we need to prevent that now so that we are not fooled in a couple of years' time. I mean, Fabrice, when you're talking about uh, this, uh, it's, it's artificial intelligence. It sounds very intelligent. Now the European elections are coming up uh, soon. How do we fight this? Do, you, do we use technology as well to, to fight it? Well, in principle, uh, you can fight artificial intelligence with artificial intelligence. Uh, and the idea here would be to develop, and this is what the Transatlantic Commission on Election Integrity is trying to do, uh, to develop a kind of detector, a, a filter system, which will allow you to basically spot whether a video is authentic or whether it has elements that could lead you to think that it's a deep fake. So potentially people could have an app on their, on their iPhone and they receive a video via WhatsApp because WhatsApp is going to become the new breeding ground of distortion and fake news. You, you can scan through the video, your app, in order to know if it's a fake or an authentic uh, video. And I think it's important because people need to have a critical mind. They cannot take everything they receive on WhatsApp, Facebook, wherever, on fa by face value. So this app will help them to exert that critical mind. All right, thank you very much uh, for that, uh, Fabrice Potier, talking to us live there from Brussels. Uh, Marita, I'll go to you first, because during the debate uh, earlier on the topic, you were one of the few, or if not the only one, I don't remember, who actually talked about deepfake. Yes. Do you think that politicians understand the risk and how big of a risk is it? Uh, it is? I don't think the full scope of all the risks is really appreciated. Uh, deepfake is one thing, but think also about the technologies that are used in the elections themselves. Uh, I also called for a stress test of election technologies. And if we look at the US now, there are so many allegations of you know, what went wrong in the systems during the midterms. Uh, it has to be reliable technology if we are going to use technology for voting. So that's another thing. And I also believe that the whole uh, platforms, you know, social media like YouTube, Facebook, that are pushing information for profit, where we don't know who's paying for a message, whether it's a political actor or not. We don't know whether a conspiracy is surfacing or an authentic uh, newscast on, for example, YouTube. And we've seen many horrible examples where the most outrageous messages were surfacing to the top. And uh, there needs to be much more transparency in the algorithms behind these business models, also in order to preserve liberal democracy. And, and Jan, you're going into an election campaign and, and, and the election also. Um, you know, when, when we look at this, how ready is the EU, in general, we're talking about disinformation and uh, fake news, how ready is Europe for this? And when it comes to technology, is there maybe a lack of tech skill, enough tech skill to be able to fight something like this? Uh, the question is, what do you mean by EU? Of course, there are individual political actors, candidates, political parties, and I believe that uh, they should spare some money and they should, uh, they should buy, they should acquire themselves with uh, relevant devices, with relevant uh, counter-attacking technologies that will help them at least partially to fight this type of fake news uh, in the elections. Uh, when it comes to European Parliament or European institutions, I believe that uh, they work enough and that they understand uh, the threat. But uh, you probably cannot order political parties or individual political actors to participate in the elections to do that. They either do that or don't. 
My own party is trying to cope with that. Uh, I cannot speak on behalf of other political parties. I mean, is there a need to actually be thinking about this for every politician now to have this in, in their heads? It could oh, to be considered. absolutely. And it's yeah, our no. responsibility also to share the best knowledge available. I mean, you know, political parties generally are not very well funded. You know, candidates may not have access to that knowledge, even though they themselves are vulnerable. Also to hacking or, you know, allegations about them that can be used in a campaign context. And you're so positive we can fight at this? We have to do what we can. We have to do what we can. And I think also looking at the position of candidates and political parties vis-a-vis, -vis, for example, leaks. You know, we've mm. seen that in the past uh, in the campaign for the presidency here in France, where Macron was, you know, alleged to have all kinds of uh, issues wrong with him. And there the media said, we're not publishing this 48 hours before the elections. We're not picking up on these alleged leaks. Mm. And I think that proved to be a very good defense against those who wanted to very last minute try to distort the debate and try to actually influence the elections and in this France. Is, this is this is certainly something we'll be uh, watching closely when it comes to the European elections. I mean, very sensitive, uh, sensitive issue. On